Welcome, Your Highness. It is, uh, <laughs> it is great to be having you teach a class. You know, I've been trying to get this to happen since, what, about September? Yeah, um, I think we planned it in September. So, yeah, <laughs> it's always great to have uh, great teachers teaching classes. And th I think this is an important class for the future of our of our game. The, our ability to produce uh, helmets to keep people safe on the field. Um, like at all levels, you know, it is what keeps this game going. One of the one of the things that I think every fighter or you know anybody in a martial activity, whether it be cut and thrust or whether it be uh, fencing or whether it be heavy archery, you need to know how to maintain your own equipment. You need to know. I, I like my guys; they all know how to build elbows, knees. Well, my guys know how to build helmets, but um, and I'm here to share that with everybody. But I think you should be able to create yourself at least a reasonably to put together kit spent for the activity you do. It's like you don't know if you own a car, you need to should you should know how to change the oil, do the tires, you know, know when your windshield wipers are bad. It's kind of the same thing in fighting, right? You should know when it's time to wash your gammas in. You should know, oh crap, I broke the strap, how to know how to make basic buckles and basic straps. And you should be able to bang yourself out a set of knee cops and elbow cops. Every fighter should know that. Doesn't matter what circle they come from. And I and I think it's an integral part of if you use your equipment, you should know how to maintain and build your equipment. Especially in a game like this, when a lot of us don't have two nickels to rub together, but you might have 10, 15 bucks to go get yourself a piece of metal and knock out a whole kit, right? I mean, mild steel is cheap. You can get 14 gauge mild and pretty much out of that mild steel, you can build a complete kit head to toe for right around 35 bucks. So, well, a little more because there's some other consumable bits, but approximately base material cost to build knees, elbows, helmet, gorget should cost about $35 and a lot of sweat equity. And so um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Kendrick, I'm the Prince of the Summits. Uh, thank you, Your Excellencies, for hosting this class. My camera guy here is my squire, John, John Purchase. And, uh, and uh, he's gonna be running the camera. If you have any questions, please ask inside the chat. Um, if you, after this class is over, we might not get to the whole entire helmet today, but if this class is over, I also run a Twitch channel where I teach these classes on Twitch. If you're interested, uh, DM me or DM His Excellency and I can send that information out and you can follow along Monday through Friday. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. It's just a different platform that I use. And I just started it up because I had a lot of people ask me, hey, how do you build this? And I was like, well, hell, I'll start a Twitch channel. Um, and so we're doing that. Uh, also, if His Excellency or if there's enough interest, we can do a follow up uh, class to finish this project out. At the end of this class, I'm going to donate this helmet to, uh, I'm going to put it up for sale and I'm going to donate the proceeds to St. Jude's Children Hospital. It's my favorite charity. Um, so if anybody's interested in this particular piece, hit one of us up let us know afterwards but the fun that's where the funds are going to go once i recover my ten dollars in material costs um <laughs> so uh other than that i guess uh let me go ahead and drop this a couple safety notes when you're working with metal or sharp objects gloves eye pro ear pro if you're banging this nothing hanging from your neck i'm gonna would you go put that in the box please and my chains um you don't want anything, no jewelry, right? And you always, 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 number one rule, and you don't want to get caught like I did where you get a piece of metal in your eye, eye protection. And as most any crafter knows, we're going to probably bleed on this project at least once today. But this is the bare minimum safety gear that you want to do. Um, getting a, I had to have a metal sliver pulled out of my eye earlier this year. It is not comfortable. It is not fun. And you will, oh. Oh, I think those are better. Um, and it, you will not have a pleasant experience. So once John gets back out here, he's setting the coronet up for me. We're going to go ahead and put on our safety gear. When we start banging, uh, there will be a point where, in which we weld today um, just a little bit. But So if you have uh, issues with photosensitivity or um, any issues with epilepsy or triggers migraines or anything like that, I'll put out a, a, a warning ahead of time. Go ahead and either shut your video down or just, you know, look away from your camera, 
it's only going to be about two minutes of welding through this whole entire process. All right, John, let's grab that camera and we'll come over here. There's a couple components when building a spanging helmet. We have what we call our band. Now I did a lot of pre pre drilling so that you guys didn't have to sit here and watch me do a lot of drilling. Um, so I pre drill my holes, but this is called the center band. This is the part that goes. This is the helmet we're building today. So this right here is this part right here. Okay. Then we have our center band, right, which goes over the top and that looks like this. We have our side bands, which are two pieces and they look like this. We have our cheek plates, which is this part right here. So, which is this piece right here. And then we have our four panels, which start off looking like this. When they're dished and ready to go, they start, they end up like this, okay? Now, the first thing we'd like to want to do, and of course, anybody has any questions, please put it in the chat and we will continue. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit of a history about the spang, and the spang can be found in almost, you go ahead and put it back down there, just aim it up towards me. Sorry, we got, we got to figure out this camera work. Okay, so the spang and helmet was used in almost every single culture in the world. Um, you'll find it in Asia, you will find it in uh, Africa, you will find it in Europe. The Vikings obviously use it. We're a Viking kingdom. We see a lot of that. You will see it in, uh, I'm not sure, but I almost want to say at least some evidentiary, maybe not of metal, but uh, in Mesoamerica. And I can't confirm that. I think I was reading a paper on it the other day, but pretty much you will find the Spangen helmet everywhere in the world at some point or period. Typically you will find it early, early period or plate things that were mass produced because it doesn't require a lot of sheet metal. So it's, it's a lot of, as you can see, it's a lot of small pieces. So you, you will see it in a lot of areas where you have um, a, not a huge, like huge iron mines or large access to steel or metal of that time period. Yep. What kind of base plate do you tend to use with these? So I use a couple different kinds. Do we have one of my uh, rib bones up there? So a lot of times I'll do a bar grill, but I also uh, I also do stuff like this, where I'll have a decorative grill. This right here is a Varangian helm I made for a friend of mine named Sean. Uh, over in East Kingdom is just waiting for the everything to open up and everybody not to be sick for me to go mail it. But this also is the same pattern. So this is an example of some of the cool stuff you can do with this spanging pattern. Um, but typically I will do what a uh, bar grill, a standard bar grill. Do we have a standard bar grill over in here? No. Um, I'm sorry, guys. Give me a second here. I didn't even, that was a question I didn't anticipate. Um, God, I don't have any bargains. <laughs> so, oh, that's all right. So I'll do a bar grill or I'll do what I call a rib, uh, rib bone cutout. I don't have any examples of it right now, um, but it basically shapes like this here. And what it is, is it's just simple slats across like this, or I'll do ye old standard uh, bar grill. Um, but I prefer this, especially if I'm sending a kit helmet, what I'll do is I'll, it's, God, I can't believe we don't have any of those around here. We used them all up, huh? I guess so. All right, well, I guess I gotta order some more from Castile. Um, but it, when I send out the kits, I have a special face plate that I'll shape and uh, do, and it's basically just cross slats like this and 10 gauge steel. Um, and then all you have to do is click it on and drop six rivets like this. The first place I always like to start when I'm building these, right? Once you, let me, let's, let's talk a little bit about prep work. The better prep work you do, the less headache you will have down the line. I tend to pre-drill all my holes. I sat down with uh, uh, my Sam over at Castile Armory and we made this pattern mathematically perfect. Um, 
Now, not everybody's gonna have that opportunity or anything. So the base idea is that the more prep work you do, the easier it's gonna to go together and the finer and better it's gonna to go together. Please do not kill yourself on the, on the arm. Thank you. Um, now, a lot of people have this idea that a spanking helmet is basically a band, a band, and a band, and it's all straight, right? It's all flat bands. Well, that could really be anything but the truth. If you notice, this piece here has a gentle curve. It's a little warped, but you'll notice it has a gentle curve. Sean, can you pick that camera up so that they can kind of see where it is? So you notice that it's not exactly straight. And the reason for that is, is when it comes together, we want it to basically pop out a little bit. As you notice, this band, once it's all together, it kind of sits there. Now, how you get this shape here, which we'll go over in a moment, is by adjusting and shaping the cheeks. The slats are pretty simple. You can make those any way you want. This is an older one that I used to wear because I wanted to test out the pattern to make sure it was safe. Um, oh, yeah, that's what else I want to talk about. Now, there's a couple of different spanking styles. Here's another example of a spanking style. This is a 12 panel. So basically, it's one of these split into three with a little bit of overlap. And this was actually pulled, this style was actually pulled out of a dig. I can't remember the exact spot of the dig, but bear with me here, guys. I hit metal till it looks pretty. That's what I do. Uh, <laughs> so, but this is an example of a 12 panel. As you can see, it's made of three individual panels plus a similar band on each, on each panel. The undercarriage or what I call the undercarriage or the curtain here, you can make whichever way you want. You can do long cheeks, you can do the uh, vowels great, more of a Celtic sign, you can do anything else. And that's really gonna determine the look of your helm. Whether it be a four panel, a 12 panel, I've seen people do these in three panels, which is kind of complicated. You can do the high point with the, um, with the, the Rus helmets or the Russian helmets with the big, church looking brass on the front Got a but, question yep oh what gauge do you use for the 12 panel i do 14 gauge stain this one here is a 14 gauge stainless but you can do this in 14 gauge um the rules say 16 gauge i recommend no less than 14 gauge mild um i typically do 16 gauge uh or sorry 14 gauge stainless and 14 gauge mild in my multi-piece helmets or the four panels or this due to weight but uh and in my mild i will do use 14 in these but in a solid top uh example here <laughs> these i tend to use uh do 12 gauge this is a 12 gauge stainless top but in mild i typically make these 12 gauge as well just because the mass is more protective to your brain uh, more mass on the helmet, the less shock your brain's going to get. And I won't, I refuse to sell or build a piece of armor that will get somebody hurt. I don't know of anybody that's ever been hurt in one of my helmets, and I like to keep it that way. Always, always about safety um, at the end of the day. So, all right, let's go ahead, and I guess we'll go ahead and get on to shaping. We're going to go ahead and get on to part one of this process. Now, as you can see, guys, I have a couple different specialty tools. I have my press, but this press is absolutely worthless if you don't know how to use a hammer and make it with a hammer. The press is a time saver, but it's not necessarily going to teach you how to build armor. So the best way to learn how to build armor is you can do a couple of things. You can get yourself an engineering hammer, which I would recommend. But if you're going to get an engineering hammer, what you want to do is you want to take a grinder and you want to smooth this out so that you don't have any sharp 90 degree angles. So it just needs to be round and smooth. And you can come over to a stump. Can they see the stump here? Yep. If you notice, I have different shapes in this stump here for different things. So you notice I have different, different depths here. Now I've cheated and I've spent uh, some money and I went ahead and got these metal dishing forms. Yeah, maybe I should give a tour of the tools before we start shaping. So we have three different dishing forms that I primarily use. This is my shallow or my cheek or my starter dish. This is really good for 
items or places that you don't necessarily want a super deep dish. This is what I call my actual helmet dish right here. So we start with this one and we move it to this one. This one's just a little bit deeper. You can get these from Ironmonger. You can get them from a couple, a Cup Meltol, a couple different people out there um, that make tools and sell tools uh, for armoring. But this is shallow, a little deeper. And this one right here, we use for elbows and knee cops to get that nice, deep, heavy dish. And this is what you would use for, here's an example, getting that, that deep dish on this knee here right because this one isn't quite deep enough and this one's not quite there but this one will do it this will give you that nice move that metal really nice so this next tool i use a lot of my garland rawhide hammer which looks like this this is a five pound hammer um i use it for everything if i could get away with it, i mean i'd sleep with it if i could mm, but it doesn't make a good pillow so <laughs> So this is what I use the most of for actually hand hammering. It's got a good weight thing. These are kind of expensive. These are running about 80, 90 bucks, um, but you don't necessarily need this to start. Harbor Freight and a couple of the other tool stores will sell a rawhide mallet. What it is, it's got a rawhide facing head, a two inch with a copper uh, head on the other side. You can pick those up for 20, 30 bucks at Harbor Freight at uh, any of your industrial supply stores um that deal with this but you definitely if you're going to be moving any kind of metal you don't want necessarily a super hard surface or you're going to be spending a lot of time on the plenishing stake which is okay if you like to plenish my next hammer i use is a three dollar harbor harbor freight nylon hammer now this uh, a friend of mine turned me on to this thing and this thing is wonderful it doesn't scratch or mar the metal but it will move the metal the way you want it to move um, and then we'll go over here to my, my stake setup. I got these from Ron Halbert. Uh, this is a riveting hammer. This is used for getting way deep into the helmet or into a, a location without actually where you couldn't get a normal hammer. So he sells these in a kit um, that comes with this base, this hammer, and this ball stake. And I don't know what the price is it's been years. Now, this is my stake setup. There's just a question. Yeah. Uh, can you leave a list of suppliers for those finishing forms? A absolutely. I'd be more than happy. Um, Ron Halbert, you can look him up on Facebook. He's been making tools on the Armor Archive and for SC Armors for 20 years. Um, and him and Mel Tolb. I don't know if Mel Tolb's still in business, but I know Halbert's in. He also did the Carlos the Crusader kits, and uh, he's done a um, couple other uh, um, armor kits for individuals. So if you come, right, we'll bring that over here. So this is my stake platform. I have it welded to my table. I just built myself a new uh, fab table. It weighs about a thousand pounds. Um, but this has three different size or two different size holes. It has a, a one inch and a half inch, and I use this in my stake holder to use and manipulate the metal over things for raising. There's thousands of different styles of stakes. I have my two balls, my edge plastic, which sits like so. And this I use for like breeze making, uh, moving out or uh, pushing metal outwards. So I'll set it here, upside down, flip it up over here, hit it some more. Um, then I have what we call my rivet setters, and there's a couple of different ways. I use two sizes of rivets. I use three sixteenths and eighth inch. I try to keep them standard because it's easier to order, and I don't have a lot of specialty rivets that are just one-offs. I have my two uh, stake here. I don't know if you can see those. This one's set for three sixteenths. This one's set for an eighth. They just simply sit in here, and this will allow this allows me to achieve riveting without flattening the top of this, okay? If you don't have access to a lot of these tools, anvils, and things, I'll show you a really good uh, product. Hang on, I'm gonna just grab this real quick. And you can find these at most scrap yards. This was my first anvil, and it's just simply a chunk of railroad tie. This was given to me by my knight years ago. We've got the, this right here is a great way to start 
you can find these at any scrap yard, um, any place that sells metal scrap, you'll find railroad tie. It's got a couple advantages. You're never gonna really be able to grind into this a lot, but what you can do is flip it over for a nice smooth surface if you so want to. You can set it on its side to get different angles for fluting, bending, rolling, and all in all for 10, 15 bucks, it gives you a solid, nice peening surface for riveting, doing your leather work, whatever. And you really don't need a chunk like this, maybe something about like this. There's even some people out there who take this railroad tie and turn them into mini anvils. Like so. So there's options out there if you don't have a lot of money. I started doing this with two forms and one ball stake and I was able to make helmets out of them and a grinder for my cutting. Uh, another one of my tools that I have that I really like is my Beverly shear. Um, you don't need a plasma table or a plasma cutter or anything crazy like that. You can pick these up used on eBay uh, and you wanna make sure you get a Beverly shear, but you can get a throwless shear at Harbor Freight for hundred bucks. Um, but if you, if you have the little extra money, look at or look around for these on eBay. You can find them anywhere from three to $600. This particular one's a B2. Uh, if you get a B1, it'll cut your 14 gauge um, mild and it'll cut 14 gauge stainless with a little, with some effort. Someone is asking B3? Uh, B3 is good if you're cutting 12 gauge. Um, but the problem with the B3 is, is you can't get a lot of turn. So if you're going to go with the B3, you're going to uh, end up finding yourself doing a lot of grinding work to get your pieces ready to start. Um, you won't be able to make, let's see if I can find an example here, of uh, a really twisted piece. Okay, here we go, shoulders. So you're not going to be able to get these kind of cuts on a B3. B3. This is a set of shoulders, um, but on a B2, you can. Um, the B3 has an additional part to hold metal. So if you're gonna be cutting out a lot of 12 gauge and higher, you're gonna want a B3. If you're gonna be doing a lot of 14 gauge and that kind of stuff, you're gonna probably be okay with a B2. If you, uh, uh, the, also the price difference is, is you can find a B1 or a B2 from anywhere from three to $600. A B3 will 12 to $1,500. I mean, it's meant for some pretty heavy stuff. And I think on a B3, you can cut up to, no, nah, not just under half inch. But in armor building, there's really no reason to have that much cut because you just don't need it. Nobody's gonna wear a half inch helm. Heck, most people won't even wear a 10 gauge helm. Uh, pretty much in the SCA, the highest we go is 12 gauge. Any other questions? That's it so far. Okay. Now, if you don't have the extra capital laying around to invest in this kind of tools, that's okay. There's still plenty of stuff you can do. You can get yourself a little a leather worker's anvil and you can just grind, drill in a little notch here for your rivets to sit in, let's see, there we go. For your rivets to sit in and boom, you can achieve the same effect I do with this tool right here, okay? Another way, another thing is, is these dish forms can all be created on a stump to save you time and money, just find yourself some wood. Uh, you can also do a, uh, what is it? Um, a uh, four by four or a, uh, a four by four or four by six piece of wood cut it down and then just take your uh, flap wheel or a sander, you know, and sand out the space or hole you need. It's gonna break down over time, but it'll at least allow you to achieve the dishing and the um, sizing that you want to be able to make whatever project you want. And the nice thing about wood is it's cheap. Any other questions? You're good so Okay, so to the hand, back to the hammers, another hammer you're gonna want is I would highly recommend a small ball peen and a large ball peen. You can see you can get any kind of ball peen, but one of the things you're gonna to wanna to do is if you notice, where is she? Where was she? Ah, you notice your ball peen hammer comes with this little lip right here, right? Well, every time you hit your metal, that's gonna mar it and leave a, a mark. So what you wanna do is you wanna take your grinder and you wanna make that, su that sucker nice and smooth, right? Because I don't like 90 degree angles on anything, including my tools. Um, unless I'm doing fluting, there's really no reason for it. So, first thing we wanna do is we wanna prep our metal 
by cutting it out, whether it be by grinder. Like I said, I started this with a, oh, that's probably so much to talk about. If you don't have access to a Beverly shear or somebody with a plasma cutter or something like that, you can do what's called grinder cutting. And grinder cutting is simply taking one of these wheels and fixing it to your grinder. And again, before you handle this grinder, gloves, ear pro, eye pro. And by pro, I mean protection, okay? You simply take this onto your piece of metal, can you shine over here? And with your line, you just simply do small passes, okay? Until you get to a point where you can take your metal and bend it off your piece. Then you're gonna take your flap wheel, and I'm doing this because I don't wanna get the computer all dusty. That's why we did all the, what we call the dirty work earlier. And you take a flap wheel or a sanding disc, right? And you can buy these at pretty much any place that's not Walmart or Fred Meyer. And they do have some there, but they're garbage. So don't go there. Um, go to a industrial supply store, um, a coastal, a uh, Harbor Freight, or um, any kind of welding store will have these, but you're gonna get what's called a flap wheel. And this is basically a sanding disc. And you can get them in different grits, 120, 80 grit, uh, 40 grit, depending on what you want to do. And I use the heck out of these. I probably go about through three to four weeks on a, three or four of these a week on a good day. But you'll take this. No one's asked it, but what grit do you, you usually use? I usually use between 40 and 80 grit um, for my initial. And then I use 120 grit. And then I use my scotch Bright pads for my finish work. Then you're simply going to go over this because one another thing you want to be cautious with metal, metal will cut you. I mean, our knives are made of metal and all that. So you want to make sure that when I grab this, I'm not cutting myself. No cuts. So we're going to take this and we're going to simply pass over it like so on both sides. And then we're going to take our finger and we're going to go like this. If you feel any kind of lip, back to the grinder. Another way you can do it is you can take a hand file and smooth out the edges. Cause you, the last thing you wanna do is forget to put your glove on, be doing this and end up going to the hospital and getting 20, 30 stitches. Cause you just laid your hand open all the way down to the tenant. Then you're out for fighting. You're out for working on anything. Heck, you're even out for playing your computer games. So we always wanna make sure that our metal is not gonna hurt us. Okay, so. We're, we're, we're read about to bear with me here, everybody. It's been a while since I've talked this much to anybody. <laughs> um, uh, you were on the shaping. Huh? Shaping. Okay. Shaping. So again, we're going to do this here. And before we start shaping, go ahead and put that down and let's get some ear pro on. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, how to do it with a cheap hammer. Okay, the two dollar, the two dollar fifty cents. These also come with a lifetime guarantee. T, if you have a Harbor Freight, you beat it till it breaks. You go change it in. They give you a new one. Don't cost you nothing but a trip down to the store. So the first thing I want to do. Are we still unmuted? Yeah, you're okay. Still good. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get this into the appropriate shape, right? Again, you notice this isn't straight. This has a gentle curve to it. And the reason for that is because when it all comes together, it makes it line up just right. Now, your initial shaping is never going to go as easy as you want it to. It just never does. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this on. And what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to take it to this form and I'm going to follow it through. Can they see? Okay, so we're going to, we're basically, we're going to start in the middle. And I have it marked here because this is the only spot on this whole pattern where these two holes are just inside of these two holes. That's my back and this is my front, right? And what I want to do is I want to start here and work out. And I'm going to start here and work out. And you'll kind of see it all come together. So we're going to go ahead and put, our, put this on mute and let you guys watch what we're doing here. And then I'm going to go ahead and clean it up with my really good hammer. I know a lot of you won't have this, but it's okay. You'll get the idea. All right, here we go. Okay, it's on mute. Okay. Now, if you notice what's going on here, this is starting to match the curvature of my dish. 
right? But you'll see something weird. You see how it's kind of starting to twist? So this isn't exactly on par. This is gonna to wanna to do this. It's gonna to wanna to kind of do this. So when it does that, you just kind of grab it, pull it back into shape and then continue on. And we're gonna do a pass in, in this form or here, shine over here. Heck, you can do it on the wood stump. Oh. that we're getting a little bit more of a curve, right? Now I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to hand, uh, my, my actual metal dish. I just wanted to show you that it could be done on a stump, but I'm gonna switch into my metal dish for time sake here and switch hammers. We're gonna to go to the slightly deeper dish. And I'm just gonna use, ah, we we'll use a ball peen. Show you that it can be done. Now, what happens, right? Whenever you run anything through a given form, you're probably gonna end up with a circle. Now there's a problem here. Our heads are not circle. Now, as a general rule of thumb, if you're building something for someone that you don't know, there's a simple way to figure out which way you wanna shape the helmet. You simply get what I call ear to ear, nose to back of head. That'll tell you approximately the shape of their head. Um, for instance, most Northern European, and like I said, this is not a hard fast rule, but most of your uh, probably Turkey, uh, Istanbul area, West, most people generally have, and not all, but a lot of people, the general shape of the head is gonna be more football shape. Um, if you're looking at Ethiopian armor, um, you'll notice that it's a little larger in the back and a little narrower in the front. And uh, East Asian, you're going to see that it's a lot more round. And that has to do with genetics. There's nothing to do. But in order to figure that out without going, hey, what race are you? And offending somebody or hurting somebody's feelings, you simple. And, and nothing's absolute, right? There's a lot of a lot of people over the census, since armor was being used, had cultures have mingled, merged, so on and so forth. So this isn't a hard, fast rule, but that's the reason why some of these are shaped. Northern European tend to be more football shaped um, and uh, American Indian tend to uh, be an amalgamation depending on which coast they're from. And I think that has to do with the Clovis people and you know, way thousands of years ago. But to get that win, what you basically do is you grab a square. Would you grab that square over there? And what you ask or you, how you measure is you basically stand up against the wall and you touch this to the tip of your nose. And this should give you approximate measure of where you're going to be. Same thing for the ear, ear to ear. Piece of paper, bam, that'll give you this. Now, how you size a helmet is you take this measurement around the brow and you add four inches. That four inches accounts for a half inch of padding. Um, depending on how the helmet is built and how it is shaped, that will determine um, whether it's a little narrower here, a little bigger here, you need more padding up here, less padding here, so on and so forth. But approximately, if you have a 22.5 inch head, your helmet band, should be 26 inches or 26.5 inches. And that will allow for enough sufficient padding in that helmet that your brain is not gonna get rattled. Do we have any questions? Question about that? the hammers. Okay. I have dished with a rawhide mallet. Is there a noticeable difference using the teardrop mallet from Harbor Freight on how behave? Yes. So for some reason, because of the way this is, see how it cones down? That gives me all a lot of force into that area. I typically only dish with this hammer, um, but I wanted to give you an example in this demonstration of a $2 hammer that you can do this um, to, to be able to do this with. That's why we use the, um, 
ball peen and this to get, to get this to this point. Because I'm trying to give examples that anybody can go to the store today and be a, and get a stomp and a hammer and put together a helmet. Now, you'll notice we have this kind of spiral effect going on. And if you look at this metal, right, it's actually canted in a little bit, right? So even if I put it right on, it's here. So we simply pull it back apart a little bit and you adjust it by just kind of so that you're getting an approximate lineup, right? It's never going to be perfect. Another important thing to remember, and I like if you're building a helmet by hand, by doing all the cutting and hole drilling, it's never going to be perfect. You are not a machine. Don't try to be a machine. There's going to be mistakes and errors that you as the creator of the item will see, but nobody ever will. I run into this all the time. I'll give you a really good example. I'm on the t-shirt on, Sean. So this was when I was teaching uh, John here how to build helmets, he wanted a 14th century kit. So we put together this helmet for him, and this was the first time I had ever built one of these. Right? Now, everybody that looks at this helmet says, wow, that looks amazing. I see every mistake in this helmet. Every single one. But not very many other people do. And the reason for that is, is because we created it together, we, are, we know where we were like, oh, that grind was a little flat right here, or it's a little not quite here. But you're not a machine. You don't machine parts. You're not a big industrial factory. This is a work, think of it as a work of art, not as a model. So I just want to point that out because I run through that. I'll stare at a helmet for days going, oh, that's just slightly off, but nobody else will see it. So that's just a tip. And if you really want to know, close your eyes, walk away, come back, look at it first time and how it turns out. Well, you'd be like, oh, OK, it's good. So but nothing is ever going to be perfect if you make it by hand. And that's some of the cool characteristics of it. There you go. Thank you, John. All right. So back to this part. Right. So if you also notice, we've got kind of a little bit different lip here than here. Now, what I like to do at this point is I like to take these uh, vice grips. All right, here we go. And what I'm lining up are my holes. And this is why I like to put my holes in first. And if I move it too fast or too slow, please let me know. Um, I could spend as much time. I love teaching. When I clamp that into position, I'm setting up for what I, but what I'm looking for is these two holes to be in alignment. We want those two holes and these two holes because these are our front and back marks. Okay. And yep, it's not even the head shaped yet, but that's all right. We're going to get there in just a moment. Also, if you happen to be an on tier, or the West or anywhere near near my house, when this COVID lockdown is over, if you decide you wanna come up and make a helmet, I do teach a class um, where if you bring your own material and rivets, it won't cost you anything. And we will sit down and we will build a helmet over a weekend from scratch. Uh, also, one of the things I wanna do because I'm retired is I want to be able to pack up my whole shop, drive up to your barony, with all the, uh, we'll have to know the amount of students so that I can have a lot of stuff pre prepped and we can sit there and spend an event weekend or an off event weekend. And I will, we will go through the whole entire process with me there. I'll bring all my tools and we'll build you guys, you and all your fighters or non-fighters helmets um, or whatever other pieces we decide for that class. And it'll be a class structure format. Typically, if we have more than two, we need four days. So at four days, we can, um, basically get 10 people helm 10 people's helmets done in four days with this kit. All right. So, all right, I'm going to, so now you'll notice what I've done here is I've followed this line and we want a nice seamless line here. Okay. And we're not worried about the shape of this because this is going to shape when we put the rest of the pieces on. Gas set up. Gas is set up. Power on. Okay. A couple things to note when you're working with uh, 
a welder of any kind is make sure your area is clean of any combustible items, paper, uh, leather, well, not so much leather, but uh, paper, anything fabric, uh, any flammable fuels, oils, gases. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm using a MIG welder setup with my ESOB here. Um, and a CO2 argon. Now you can also do this if you have a welder, but you don't have a, a gas welder, you can go spend $80 and get yourself what we call a little buzz box. And that buzz box from Harbor Freight or from Fred Meyer or any uh, Lowe's kind, you can basically do this and use flux core and weld mild steel. I use a gas setup because I weld stainless. And for me, I like gas better, but if most people can't afford the setup that I have, I'm not saying that you can or can't, I'm just saying it's a lot of money to invest when you're only doing a one-off project. My welder and my tanks for my gases are 800 bucks. You can rent them and there's other ways around, or you can just go pay a welder 20, 30 bucks if you have a friend who has a setup and get it done that way too. All right, so. Uh, also, gloves, welding shield, you're going to need and want. All right. So, all right, let me do this. Uh, can I borrow your user? My table is my fab table. Uh, if you don't have a metal table or something, what you can do is you can take a piece of metal and you can put it over a plastic table as long as you can clamp your ground to your piece and that'll shield a plastic table or whatever thing, but you do have to be conscious of that under shield getting too hot and melting whatever you have on it or burning or whatever it is. So just something to keep in mind and remember. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna weld this seam. Traditionally, for some, um, all the evidence that I've seen um, on all, on especially this, the Bible and a few other armory books is this band was one piece. It's like they forge welded it together. Unfortunately, I don't do forging, so we're gonna just weld it together. <laughs> I do know some people that do amazing jobs at welding, but not not or uh, forging. I am not one of them. I am just simply an armorsmith. Okay, so we're going to set our welder to the appropriate um, feed, which is 14 gauge. We're, do, we're pushing 200 degrees on this, or 200, I think it's 200 amps. Um, two, 200, 210. Your specs for each welder will be on the welder. We're running CO2 argon gas, and we're just going to go ahead and we're going to do attack and attack. We're going to pull the clamps off, we're going to seal that so that it's all one piece. All right. So I'm gonna to have to give you guys a trigger warning. Uh, please, if you have photosensitive issues at all, um, I will, I'll make an announcement of ARC and I need you guys to turn away. And when I get a thumbs up in the chat, I will weld. So go ahead, if you have issues with light, uh, this would be a good time to look away. And can I get a 100% thumbs up in the chat when everybody's ready? All right. I, all right, that, that looks like we got a lot of them. That looks like everyone? Yep. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get my feet here. All right, we're gonna weld. Three, two, one, welding. We'll say, Sean. Just keep your eyes closed. Welding. Welding. I got a few more welding spots to do, Sean. Just a sec. There we go. We should be good there. Now I'm not going to do the cleanup on this just yet because we don't want really to need to. So, all right. We're going to let this cool down for a moment. Now, 
I did this in a hurry and the weld's not the best, but normally what I would do is I would weld the outside and then I will flip it. And I'm gonna go ahead here in a moment and I'm gonna weld the inside. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do it because we need, it needs to be done right. So I always weld outside and inside because I grind off the weld on the outside on the front. All right, gonna weld. Ready, Sean? Yep. All right. Always turn your power off and your gas off. Now, you can see we have the outside and the inside weld. Now, what we're not concerned with is you see how that's a lift there? We're concerned about these two holes. Remember I said we're human, we're not, we're not perfect. So nothing ever made by hand comes out perfect. Machines make perfect things. Now, there are some people who are better at it than I am, but for this particular demonstration, don't kill yourself and don't come out perfect. But what needs to happen is these holes need to line up as close as you can get them. And here in a moment, once this cools down, we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show you how to put the shape into it. So what we can do while this cools is we'll go ahead and we'll start preparing the other pieces and shaping them. So I'm going to set this on the ground for now. He's out of the way. I'm going to go ahead and we'll talk about shaping the center band. Contrary to popular belief on a Spangen helmet, it is not a flat band, a flat band, and a flat band. These, the side foot bands, are pretty, pretty easy to shape and they're just almost just a bend. This here, same thing, you can get away with bending it, but the part that separates it from laying down and having a seamless construction or having a, a something that looks like this is how you shape the center band. The center band is probably the most critical and the most work on this helmet. Now our center band looks something like this. And again, I already put the holes in just for simplicity, right? It's just a rectangle. It is straight. There's no special curves to it or anything. And what we do is we do, it's a two, two part process for this one. We do take our first form or our shower dish. That's given as our initial shape. All right. Then slightly deeper dish, same thing. Now we have it approximate, right? So once this band cools, so the second part of this, and this is the part that really trips everybody else. If we just take this triangle and line it up to how it's gonna go on the helmet, you're gonna end up with something like that. See that gap there? Now how we correct that and fix that is first, we do it in a dish which starts the process of bending it left and right. A lot of people don't know this. Now there's two ways you can shape this to fit this perfectly. The first way is you take a ball stake and we'll do it with a plastic hammer. And you could take it and you could just hit it. doing is we're trying to get it to a kind of a curvature shape. For this hammer really it 
I'm hitting it like this. Because I'm trying to pull that metal so that it forms to the ball. the side effects of this is it's going to deform the metal, right? And there's really not too much you can do about that. But there's a fix. How we correct this and make this smoother is we don't, we take our center band and instead of going down the middle here, we're going to move it to the side. So I use approximately this. You could do this on your wood stump, whatever form you want, but we're going to put it to the side so that this curve will help to start smoothing out this curve. And it'll also start pulling it back into shape. The reason we do this again is so that it lays flat when we go to do the rivets. And how you strike this, you can use this ball peen, right? You hit it just inside those hole marks or just about, just about a, a half inch in. This is why I like this hammer. Because you notice I got little bumps. This doesn't leave those little bumps. Notice you get, or is it back off mute? Yep. Okay, you'll notice you have little bumps here and you can see it. You basically want to get it so it matches the form as smooth as possible. We don't have all those up and down bumps. And you do this for each side. If you look at it, okay, if you look at it, we have a nice gentle curve going this way and one going this way. And it's a complex. Curve. Also, what it does is it makes this incredibly rigid. There we go. And now our center band is set, even though I found it. Okay, so our center band is set. Next part, we have our two side bands. Our two side bands are pretty easy. Got mute. We're gonna go ahead and shape these. Now these only have to be bent. They don't actually need to be dished, but I like to do them in this dish anyway. So we're gonna go ahead and mute and I'm gonna demonstrate. So now we have the next two parts of the frame. And you remember when I told you that we were going to go over and learn how to shape this, right? This particular right now won't fit really anybody's head. It looks all clunky and weird and strange and something from another planet. Well, it's because right now it is. 
So what I like to do is I take it and I'll put it back in the in my form. So I just tap it out, kind of straighten it out, and then I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna step right here and I'm gonna pull it forward. So if you show this, Sean, okay. Take it, make sure it's in the center where I want it. I just give it a tug. Now we have something starting to approximate the actual size of a head or the actual shape. Now there's gonna be some fine tuning and kind of playing with it a little bit. Get a little closer, right? But we're approximately there. Now, I'm using these, you can use nuts and bolts, but I use Clicos, these are Cost you 25 for a Clico tool and 100 of these, 25 bucks. You can get them from any aircraft, um, uh, maintenance yard or airport, any place that works on private small jets or Boeing, whatever. But you can find these all over the United. This is called a Clico or a temporary. It's used in aircraft design and building. When they put up a panel, they use these instead of the rivets. But for our purposes, we use them to start holding our stuff together, right? Now, the first thing I like to always do when I do this is I like to build my frame. I built all of you, we just shaped all of our pieces. So this should go, if everything worked out right in our prep work, pretty quick and pretty easy. So there's part one. Now, I understand it still looks a little off and a little weird, but for this, for this purpose, how I built my pattern in is that this upper and lower band, or the two side bands and the front to back band pulls it into the shape that I want it to go into. So these are always never gonna line up perfect, right? They're not. So what ends up happening is, is when I clico these together, the ten, because it's under tension, it pulls this bottom band into the correct shape and pulls all the other pieces in. Let's go ahead and get this clico together. So you start with one. That hole's a little wide. Oh, broken clico. They're cheap. They're like two cents a piece. There we go. So I always like to start with one, go to the other side, and I'm not worried about how that's shaped. That's already got the approximate curve I want. So what I'll do is I'll slide it in there and I'll just kind of put it under tension and pull it down. Same thing for the other side. One in on here. Now you notice we have that gap. Well, we won't have that gap for very long. Clip it in, angle it up, and this is where it's gonna take a little effort. Pull it down. Ah. Get it in. You see how it's already starting to come into shape? Because it's under tension, it's gonna force everything else to go where I want it to go. Now we can just fill in the rest of the Clico, so it had to do it. Of course it did. Right. This out here, and like I said, you can pick these up at almost any place that services or maintenance small aircraft or small aircraft parts, or you can order them online, 25 bucks. We'll get you a bag of like, I think 100 or 50 to 100 of these Clicos and uh, uh, the tool. And you can get them in all kinds of shapes, sizes. I have 1 8 inch to 3 16 because that's what I usually use. But you can get any size in between. They also have cool little things that work like this, like little clamps, stuff like that. It's worth checking out if you want. I can uh, always provide that information on where to buy them from. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, but I think McMaster Cars has them. I know McMaster Cars has rivets. Ah. 
Try to figure out why this is all of a sudden not wanting to do. Maybe a bad prep would have gotten on. Sick here. Like I said, none of this has ever come in perfect and it never will. So you will have moments like I'm about to have right now. <laughs> this works on my on my on my on my Now, if you run into these problems, these clicks are also good because you can do cool things like what I'm about to do right here. Just angle it in. Um, there we go. Now, the bad part about using vice grips is they do more of the metal. But if it's your first helmet, hey, who cares? You built a helmet, right? How cool is that? How many other people you know can build a helmet? All right, I think we're okay. Yeah, that's. That kind of got off a little bit there, but I think our general premise is about right. All right, so give me a sec here. We're just going to have to adjust the hole here. Uh, question: What diameter on the Clico clamps? Three sixteenths. Click all, all Clico clamps use one tool. They're all the same size tool. The only thing that changes. Are, is the head, is this part of the Clico itself. Here, this part right here, that's the only thing that changes. This is a 3 16 That's a 1 8 Oh, they can't see it. Oh, cool. Sorry, yeah, that's a 1 8 Any other questions? That's it. OK. Cool. Yep. All right, sorry about that, guys. I'm not the camera out. Everybody can see again? Uh, yeah, it should be up and running. Okay. Remember how I said because it's under tension, it's going to pull it into shape? If you notice, it's slowly pulling it all into shape. We have that nice, gentle curve. It's all stretching out, underside, right? You see how this side's a little flat? How we can fix that. This click go out because it should be trying to get into its primary shape. There you go. And you see how we're more rounded now? And we just walk through some feet until we get it exactly where we want it. Sorry, Sean, grab that tank for vice grip. Perfect. Another cleat go in. And it's really for, for the build that we did here, it's the tension that brings it all together. Um, a lot of people struggle because they, they try to build it round and stretch it out. Well, that doesn't really work. You really kind of got to have the idea or a good solid pattern ahead of time. Um, you can make it work, but this this uh, this band right here is tricky, right? For to get it to the shape of a head, right? So this is this helmet, particular helmet here, is made for a 24 inch head. So once the panels are in it and everything, we should be good to go, All right? But you can see now we're pulling it into position, all right? And you'll notice that I've got a little lip here on the bottom, a little lip here. How you fix that in mild, because stainless is a little bit different animal. It's a devil's metal. If you take yourself a long vice grip, reach up until you grab it, and just simply give it a pull, right? And that'll flush it out with the band. Now at this point, 
you have two options. You can say, I'm going to go ahead and weld it into position, and then you don't have to worry about the clicos, or you could just start riveting it from here. I am a fan of welding my band into position. You see how we kind of flushed all that up there? Your, your fingers are kind of in the way. There you go. Something is not right. Oh, no, 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 something is right. I was thinking these were the cheeks. I was like, why are they so far forward? Ah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead for simplicity's sake, we're gonna go ahead and tack weld these, these positions in um, so that I can pull the clicos out and I can walk through the next process. Like I said, this will only take a moment, guys. I'm just, all I'm doing on the inside here is I'm doing a quick spot weld and it's mostly just to hold it all in place so I don't have to have the clicos all over the place. All right. We're gonna weld here. Every All right, we're gonna go ahead and weld. Yeah. So please, if you have a problem, look away. Sean, you ready? Yep. All right, welding. Welding. Okay. I'm just gonna work my way around the bands just enough to get a little bit of a spot weld on each one. Welding. 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 One more, guys. Welding and welding. All right, we're good, Sean. So what that allows me to do is that just gives me a little bit more freedom of creation or freedom of movement to work with these uh, particular pieces because I don't need to have the clicos in every spot. Plus, it also allows me to be able to physically manipulate this without having to worry about breaking it. Go ahead and move back over here. Yeah, it's hot. Don't yell at me. I'm gonna let that cool down for just a sec. But I'm gonna go ahead and pull all these clicos out because we don't need them anymore, right? We already have it all we want. Now, if you have the ability to weld, I would recommend welding your bands. Um, interesting trick, if you wanna make a Norman, 
what you will do is instead of doing a lap over like this, you'll actually butt it up and that'll allow you to pull that top a little higher. Like if this was, and then you just flush it over inside and on each part. Come on. If you guys are interested in following, this isn't necessarily uh, me trying to pump my own thing, but if you guys do want, I've been running an online stream every day for uh, armor building, uh, just in my daily uh, work activity. If you are interested, uh, Hit me up after this and I will give you that channel. It's on Twitch. So if you're going to use Twitch, you'll need to find it. Or I could just Zoom call you in. I don't care either way. All right. There we go. Now you see we got our basic of our frame. It's done, everything's tack weld. And this also, at this point, this would allow us to take our grinder, clean up the edges so we can turn it black or whatever. Um, but for time's sake, we're not gonna do that. Uh, now, the next thing we need to do is we need to fit our panels. Um, first, we gotta dish them in our triangles. Now, one of the things about the triangle, you'll notice that this side's shallower than this side and this side. This is your center. This goes towards this. This goes towards the front and back. And again, if you would like these patterns, I'm more than happy to share them with whoever wants them. Um, or, you know, if you have an interest and you happen to be down here near my neck of the woods, um, come on down, spend a day or two with me in the shop. I got plenty of crash space. Um, or I can set up something where I can come to your neck of the woods, Barony, Shire, whatever, and I can teach a class over a four day period. So, all right. So now we're going to talk about shaping the triangle. While this cools down, and we can handle it. And actually, I'm going to, I'm orig uh, just for background, I'm originally from uh, Alaska or Awertha, is where I started my SCA career in the 90s. And then I joined the military and traveled to Drakenval, Meridies, Atlantia, Outlands, um, Ontier, West Kingdom, of course, because it's part of Awertha. Uh, I've also played in a couple other places briefly along my travels. Haven't made it to Lockcock or the far west yet, but someday we will. So we're going to go ahead and get back over here and we're going to talk about how to shape these triangles. Go ahead. All right. So what, one of the ways I like to do it is I use my shallower form. Can they see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I use my shallower form. And what we're going to do is we're going to first, we're going to line up our triangle. You should have two triangles where this point is slightly canted off and two triangles where they match exactly. Reason being is because you're putting them on different parts of the helmet. And to line them up correctly, um, it, it takes a lot of the wiggle room out. Um, there's many ways to do the triangle, to build a pattern on the triangle. Simply take a piece of paper slam it up in here and then draw a triangle mark your holes and then then take scissors cut them out transfer it to metal it's really easy uh, we could do a whole class on uh, pattern making in the future but for right now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to make this flat piece look like this and this ends up going in like that. You notice how nice and tight because of the prep work we did and the rounding of that. See how we've almost got it seamless? That's what we're going for. All right. So we'll get back. All right, so to shaping this, there's a there's kind of a, there's a couple different ways to do it. Everybody has their own dishing techniques and what, how I like to do it. Um, let me pull this stump over. So something also to think about is ergonomics, right? You don't ever really want to be hammering up here because it's uncomfortable. I'm going to pull the stump all the way out, Sean. Okay. All right. All right. So that's why I have this stump right here. 
This stump is at a good height. It's about my waist, which allows me to come from here to here. Y'all can see that. All right. I'm trying to trying to get you all in okay. focus. So I can I let the hammer do the work. I don't force it down. I don't I let the hammer, the weight of the hammer do all the work. I take my form, I put it on here. And if you don't have a form, you can use this your your dish that you've created. Go ahead and use the form. And what we're looking for a couple ways to grip. All right. So what we don't what we don't want is to take this piece of metal, hold it like this, and hit it with a hammer. What's going to happen is it's going to snap between your fingers and bruise you, and it's going to hurt. So how we do this is we take our two fingers, we just kind of hold here, and we hit it far away from our finger. Otherwise, you'll end up with a smashed thumb. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start here, and we're going to kind of work our way around. We'll spin the piece. And what we're striking is we're kind of trying to strike here in the middle of the, your form, right? If you want to do a little more, you can wind up here and you can angle it. That's a little more advanced technique, but we'll talk about it another time. So we're going to start here and we're going to start getting our general shape. And we're just going to kind of work it until it forms into where we want. Go ahead, mute. I want you guys to listen to something. What this is going to sound like if it's off, it's going to sound like that. But if it hits the form, it's going to sound like this. How you get the slide and not the slap, that's what you're going for. Also, if you, I don't know if you guys can see this, but if you look at this metal, you can kind of see a raised spot right here. Yeah, a couple, move it around a little bit, but it's kind of getting some glare. From here, how's that? There's a little bit of a raised spot here. You could check this by flipping it and just running your finger over it. Oh, right there, there's a little raised spot here. So that's one way to do it, but this is our initial pass on the shallow form. So you notice how I use the loose hammer? I'm letting my hammer, all I'm doing is lifting it up and letting the hammer do it. Oh. And ideally what you're gonna end up with is this completely matching this form. Now it's time for the fun part and it's time to switch forms. So this is our deeper form. This is the one we did the shape on the center and the other pieces on, like I use these two forms a lot. And we're simply gonna place this on here. Now this is the form that's gonna get your fingers snapped if you're not careful. So what we're gonna do, right, is we're gonna hit it in the middle and then we're gonna see where it starts to raise on the edge. And then we're just gonna chase that bump until we get it where we want it. All right, this is gonna be loud, so we're gonna mute. So what I did here was I hit it here and I started to pull it down and then I let it kind of slide out. And now I'm trying to start to form this to where I want. You can see how it's kind of, it's kind of starting to change that shape. And I'm not worried about it being perfect just yet. Yep. hands to a glove.
So you notice how we've got that nice deep shape. Now I'm just going to run my, I'm just going to run my hand across the outside. Feel for any flat spots, right? So I have a flat spot here, a little bit through here. Put it back in the form. Nice and dished. So how we check this, we take a few other piece. We want to make sure they're nice and lined up. And that's all there is to dishing triangles. Any questions? You saw me snap my fingers, but I gripped it too hard. No questions yet. No questions? All right. So now we have to do the fitting, all right? We need to take our frame. Now it's time to attach the triangles. Uh, you're gonna need a Sharpie. Can I do one? Okay. You're gonna need a Sharpie, your Clico tools are nuts and bolts, a hammer, and you're gonna need the drill, all right? So one of the things you want to do is you want to come through and you know where your front is, right? Because you only have the three holes here for the cheeks and no holes in the front. You going to take your Sharpie. And what I like to do is I always start from the right and I just put a one, right? And then back after that, number two, three, four. Because once we fit these, Two, three, four, and whatever width is. So once we fit these, because we're not machines and these aren't perfectly round, none of these two panels are gonna be perfect in the hole. So this panel might kind of fit this panel, but probably not. So you wanna make sure and keep them aligned because we're about to clamp these into place and put the holes in the panels. All right, so. Remember how I said it's all, it's a short side towards the front. So this would be number four. Now, common mis misconception, all of my holes are less than two inches apart. SCA minimum says two and a half inches. That's the furthest these can be apart. I like to go with about an inch and a half. Reason, it gives a little more rivets. Yeah, it's more time consuming, costs a little more to make, but it's also more structurally sound. There's no fault if you do the two and a half minimum. I just don't think mathematically or symmetrically it looks right. Um, all right. So once we figure out where we want now, also, could you here? We'll just do this. Also, another thing is, is these triangles do not have to cover every hole. Right here, you'll be going through three layers of steel. You don't actually have to have a rivet in that triangle. Why? Because between here and here is less than two and a half inches. Here and here is less than two and a half inches and here and here is less than two and a half inches, so on and so forth. So if you find yourself in a position when you go to fit your triangle that you have one open, that's okay because here to here, here to here is not two and a half inches. And you're not trying to drive a rivet through three layers of uh, steel. So what I typically like to do is I tend, tend to like them a little bit stronger on the bottom than on the top. So I'll set them like this. Now you can adjust your pattern to where you can get every single hole if you want. This is just how I do it, right? So now we're here. Now we're gonna notice we have a gap here. Can they see that? Here, uh, yeah. Here. You yeah, see that yeah. gap there? All right, and when we flip it over, we have a little space right here. So how we cure that 
right? As you think about this, what piece of this triangle needs to get pushed in or pushed out to make it sit flush? This point right here. So how we take care of that is we simply come back to our handy dandy ball state. You want to keep it in the same position. Pull it over a little bit. We're just going to give that section a little round. We call this fine tuning. Now, you'll notice that gap has gotten a lot smaller. There we go. Got a lot smaller. So now we're going to probably have to tune it in right here a little bit. Hang on, let me double check that. I think that's just where I tuned it. All right. Okay. Nope, we're going to tune it in right here on the sideband. That's this section right here. What I'm doing is I'm going a little higher on either side. Keep continuity. Two, four, there it is. Okay. Now, you'll see it start to actually really set in there. I'm gonna show what the outside is gonna look like. Okay, now I notice I still have a little gap here. Well, I wonder why that is. Well, probably because I need to tune it right here a little bit. And now look at that. See how we've almost perfectly flushed. Now you could do this process back and forth, back and forth until you get it exactly where you want it. What I like to do at this point though, is I like to cheat. And I'm gonna show you guys how to cheat. Uh, we need our clamps. Nice All right, so what we're gonna do is once we kind of start getting this into position and we make sure all of our holes are covered, is that the right, am I going the right way here? Hang on, I'm out of goof. Yeah, I, I almost goofed. Okay, so I almost told you the wrong information. Again on this, the short side goes to the center on the, the sides and the long side is front and back. I apologize for that. I almost made a colossal blunder there. So we're gonna to go to position number one and you notice how that, see how that much, how much tighter and better that fits in there? Yeah, almost made a colossal blunder, but I'm only human. All right, so at, once we start to get this into place, we're just going to simply take our clamps. Shall we reach over there and hand me another clamp? Okay. Uh, I need the flat clamps. Uh, and we're going to clamp it. We're going to start clamping this into place. Right, and we do one panel at a time. And because it is mild, and you can do this with stainless, it just takes some more effort. What ends up happening is, is this ends up pulling that metal straight to where we want it to go. Now, you can see We've got almost a seamless pen. Now, for the fun part, take your drill, and you're just going to drill straight through the holes that you already have in place. Oh, uh, you have one. 
Huh? Warren is asking if you're going to tack in place. Nah, don't need to. You can. But don't typically need to. Oh, something else important. When you're doing these center holes, remember how we said this isn't flat. So you want whichever way your drill goes into the metal is how that rivet's going to sit. So what we want to do is you want to take your center, you want to canter it just off a little bit. Right? Because we want the rivets to pull this, suck this up and push that down. And what I like to do to start is I just go ahead and I do these holes, I do these holes, and I do two holes. So basically I leave one open on each panel for right now. Give me one second bite. Sorry. Uh, all right. Getting cold up, not using PPE. Absolutely right. Thank you very much. See, this is why I cut and hurt myself all the time because I'm freaking forgetful. All right. All right. You go ahead and scan that real quick. I gotta step inside for a second. I also I owe some penance for not wearing proper PPE after I just harped on it so long. All right, so now we just basically take it because what do we do? We label, right? We want to make sure everything is labeled. How we do that is I always like to put two arrows. So this is number one. We label it number one, top, towards the center. I just put a, and then I'll put a center, a C over here. So that tells me that this is going to the front and this piece is going to the top, here and here, right? Number one, number one. So I know where that panel always goes back into place. So, so we're going to go ahead and do the, the next panel, which is short side, long side. Same process. All right, take it, we tune it up, make sure it gets in there. Same process, put it in, tune it up, clamp it down, drill the holes. Any questions? No questions? Nope. Then we will continue. You look inside there, you'll see how it's starting to come together. I'm just trying to speed this up because I want you guys to see the, the top kind of actually come together the way it's supposed to. So bear with me here. Now these panels don't have to stay in place. Once you get them labeled and marked where you want them, you can take them off and wash your two feet. I like to fit them at least with one on either side.
Another important thing to remember, sometimes while you're drilling these, they will slide. So you always want to check and make sure you have at least, at a minimum, one eighth inch from the hole to the edge of the metal. I would say try to try to do more, um, but if you have a solid eighth inch, maybe a little over eighth inch, it's not going to fail. But I always try to err on the side of caution and safety, when, especially when it comes to people's brain pans. Here we go. Now, somebody asked earlier if I was going to tack this into place. The answer is I'm not, but you could. At this point, you definitely could. Um, it's preference. So, you let everybody get a good look at that. Can they see inside there, Sean? Mm -hmm. All right. Now we got something that's starting to look like a helmet, huh? <laughs> Let me go ahead and fit these other two, and then I'll start talking about shaping the other pieces. I'm going to speed this up, so it's a good time to... I'm trying to do this so we can get on to other pieces. We need to have these pieces in place before we start the next process. All right. But toss me for the Now this is where it starts to get, it's gonna start getting dicey because we have to fit the last panel in, right? And as anybody and everybody knows, it's always the last piece that never wants to work. This one. Now, what I forget, we need to go through label number four, center. Three, center, top. Okay, so now we have the fourth panel to put on and our final panel, right? And as you can see how it's starting to come together, everything you wanna just kind of give it a visual, make sure that everything's kind of coming and laying down flush. The tighter you get this, the longer this thing will last. And there we go. Okay, so, yep, perfect. Oh, now we have a problem. How do we get a clamp on that one, right? Well, there's a couple different solutions or, or issues or whatever you want to look at it. But there's a couple different uh, methodologies. One of the methodologies I like to use 
All right, yeah, we're gonna have to do this a little different. I shaped the panel wrong. All right, so one of the, so, all right, so you notice that that should be spot on, but what, what it's not doing is you notice that we've got these gaps on these holes because I put the long side towards the cent to, towards the middle and not the front. Now that's a mistake. But how you can fix that mistake is instead of having your hole on the front, you can slide your panel over, but oh, still not gonna go. You just simply adjust it to the other side, All right? And that should, you know, just as a demonstration, there's one, give us enough room. There it is. Oh yeah, we're all on the line. Yep. And that's just another another trick from uh, doing this so so many of these that you can utilize. All right. So how we set this panel, or you can also shift it in place, is I would pull number one, number two off. Right. That allows you to get a clamp in here, and you can clamp from the bottom. Or if you really want, you can pull the rest of them off. I always like to make sure, keep them together as much as I can so that I can make sure that all my panels are gonna be where they're supposed to be. And they're gonna fit the way I want them to fit. So we're gonna pop this panel. That gives us a space that we can plant. But we can also still fit it between two plates. Okay, yeah, that looks about right. Make sure we're okay there. So now we can take our long clamp, come in from this side, clamp there. All right, looking good. Next clamp, we just go from the underneath. All right, we're just gonna go underneath this spot. Clamp it. Same thing, other side. Watch clamps be a little tight so things try don't try to slide out on you. All right, I believe. Oh, got a tune. I I forgot something. Let's tune this into position here real quick. All right, that's much better. Much better. More better, more better, more better. I believe we are on the mark. Most people don't build helms because they're intimidated by the act of building a helmet, right? It seems like so much. Really, it's just like a little set of knee cops or anything else. It's just more of a understanding how and why things work the way they work will allow you to be able to create some beautiful, beautiful stuff out there. All right, we're going to go
think of this in. And you guys will get to see what the whole entire helmet top looks like together. And not much articulation in the simple spanging. Nope. Because you're comparing it to me. <laughs> well, very true. Very true. I had to have somebody actually teach me how to do articulation because I completely forgot because I'd made so many homes I forgot how to build knees. And articulating is its own nightmare. I'd rather build helmets all day than build a set of knees. <laughs> And there we go. We have a helmet top, ladies and gentlemen. So at this point, you can come back over the ball stake here. And you see how we got these little ridges? Let's do a little bit of more tape. Doesn't have to be a lot. You're just basically counting down any imperfections that you see that you're not quite happy with. And you're smoothing out any ripples that you might see. You make it look deceptively easy. <laughs> well, the first one's always the hardest. And then each one, your, your body, you're just like fighting, right? Y'all remember what it was like the first time you walked out of the field? It was tough. Oh my God, you're wearing out after two or three fights. Your muscles are sore. But eventually, I bet most of y'all that have been fighting more than two or three months can throw a flat snap on, on command, can't you? Similar technique to repair sword hits. I'm guessing denting from... Oh, dent, yes. So similar technique. If you want to repair a piece of, uh, say you get a dent in the helmet, just simply come to one of your forms, flip it over, take your hammer, pound back out the dent, right? If you have a dent here, just pound it back out, right? Now, here's the thing. Every time you move this metal, what happens? Anybody? It's weaker. Just fatigue. That's right. It gets stressed. Bigger, thinner, thins out. So what I always like to tell people, just because you get a small minor dent in something, don't mess with it. When the dent becomes big enough that it starts to prominently become your helmet, not your helmet, but the dent. Hey, look, it's Sir Dents a lot, right? That's about when you want to do it. Because honestly, especially if you're dealing with mild, it's gonna uh, structure, the structure of the material is gonna weaken every time you move it. And for the most part, these helmets are strong, even in 14 gauge because of the way they're shaped, because of the way they're dished. And I wouldn't necessarily say work hardening of the material because a lot of the metal that we get today doesn't work harden like we would think it would. We're not using heat treating, we're not using annealing or forming it cold. So where this helmet gets its rigidity from is the way it is shaped. Whenever I get a dent on one of these, it's more of a, oh God, that means I shaped that panel wrong than, unless somebody just really took you to the moon. Um, this isn't the eighties. We're not swinging oil filled rattan swords anywhere and trying to knock each other the hell out. A lot of dents you're going to get are going to either be from stress fatigue, lack of maintenance, because every time you let this rust and you go and clean it and you let it rust and you go and clean it, you're thinning the metal. Every time you touch it with a grinder, you're thinning the metal. Every time you hit, just by the act of shaping this, we have thinned the metal. 
Um, fortunately, these tend to hold up really, really, really well, um, especially with proper care and maintenance. I do a lot more of these in stainless than I do in mild. Um, when I do make them, milds are my starter helmets. This is my $300 helmet to get somebody out on the field with. Or a lot of times they just come and build it themselves and go home with a helm. I mean, I'm a Lutz. <laughs> I'm a sap that way. But it's the structure and how you put it together and how tight these are that determines the rigidity and strength of this particular helmet. You look like you got a question? No, no questions. Just so, no responses like stop blocking with your head. All right, use your shield, damn it. Um, me, I don't use a shield. Oh, here's a question. Which hammer would you use? For, for pounding out a dent? Because it's not gonna mar the metal. It's just gonna simply push it back the way I want it. Or, haven't even talked about plenishing yet. Where's my plenishing hammer? It's over there. Ah, if you use a ball of peen, you need to have one of these. This is known as a plenishing hammer. Also, tap, 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 tap to get all the dents out. But you have to with this. What's different about working with stainless? Stainless was made for Satan himself. It's the devil's metal. Now, the truth is, a stainless is harder and it's springier. So it doesn't like to move as easy without force. If you've never, um, uh, if you ever have an opportunity, and there's a reason why a lot of armors hate doing it is stainless rivets. You'll probably see a lot of stainless helmets with a lot of brass rivets, but not a lot of stainless helmets with stainless rivets. The more you hit stainless, the more springier it becomes and the more brittle, or not brittle, but it becomes extremely more rigid and more springy. So therefore you have to do it faster, harder to get the same shape. For me to pound out a mild steel helmet or this particular panel, you saw how long it took. For stainless, it would probably take double that long and I'd have to put twice as much effort in that. Benefits of stainless, it's stainless. A 12 gauge stainless helmet is basically your forever helmet. You will never need to buy another helmet if you have a 12 gauge stainless helmet. A 12 gauge mild helmet will hold up and last, but eventually it will break down. Maybe 20 years, but it will break down. So there are some benefits to stainless. Also maintenance, you don't have to maintenance stainless because it is stainless. You don't have to worry about fighting in the rain and getting home and oiling off your helmet and making sure that nothing's gonna uh, rust up in your armor bag or you know you get home and the wife's like hey you know wife or husband's like hey I need you I know you just got home from fighter practice but I really need you to help me do this you leave your armor bag in the back of your truck or car and it's sweaty then you come back out the next day you have a rust forest in your in your bag or if you live in the Carolinas boy yeah you know what I'm talking about it's gonna Meridia, Zalantia, Glen Aubin, Trimeris any of those heavily humid areas it's gonna rust overnight. If you live in El Paso or Texas or Anciora where you where everybody uses swamp coolers, well, that's blowing humidity in there. What do you think is gonna to happen to your armor? It's gonna rust overnight. So there are some benefits. Arizona, right? You can get away with it. And in the desert areas, yes, you can get away with mild helmets. You just gotta maintenance them and not use a swamp cooler. But a lot of people in those regions do have those swamp coolers. So benefit. Miles cheaper, it's easier to work with. You saw how long it took us to build this. Um, stainless, it would have probably taken a little bit longer for me to dish the panels. Fortunately, I have a press. I can do it in a, a like, I can do a hundred of them in just a few minutes um, because I use my press like a hammer. I don't use it like a stamp. Um, so those are some of the, the differences, benefits and drawbacks between the two. Mild, generally cheaper. You can get yourself a nice helmet for five to 600 bucks. I mean, a really nice mild helmet between you know five and a grand. Stainless, you can go all, the sky's the limit in stainless, right? I've seen some uh, Acer helmets sell for 25 to three grand. Uh, the one I had before it got stolen from him, uh, I purchased for $2,200. Um, where if I would've got the same one in mild, I probably could've got away with about nine, eight, $900. 
or no, nah, probably 1100, closer to 1100. But so it's a matter of economy, um, economy. And if you don't mind doing the maintenance, you can spend two, three, three to $500, get yourself a decent helm, get out on the field, or you can spend $35 on a box of rivets, come to my shop and build your own. Any other questions? Bar grill out of stainless? Yep, I make bar grills out of stainless. Um, I tend not to mix my metals. Uh, the standard is a mild bar grill. Um, you'll see a lot of, uh, especially if it's under chain mail or something like that, you'll see a lot of armors. They'll only do mild steel bar grills. I do stainless bar grills um, because I don't like mixing my metal metals. If I put mild on top of stainless, the stainless will rust. Um, especially over time. Now I know a couple big name armors out there, they only do mild bar grills. I, I just can't bring myself to do it. I have tools and equipment that allow me to, you do a weld and fashion a stainless quarter inch bar grill in the same time it takes me to do a mild. Got like 30 more minutes. Huh? It's 7.30, so about huh. half hour. So we started at five. Yeah, that's fine. We got we got time. I'm not I'm just, not in a rush. I'm just, just giving you a heads up. Okay. So do we have any other questions at this point? No new ones right now. Okay. All right. So another, like I said, if you guys are interested, I do have a Twitch channel. You guys are welcome to follow me over there. I build armor every day, uh, Monday through Friday on that channel from noon to four Pacific time. So uh, it's crazy cans at twitchtv.com, but. Also, I'm going to go ahead and do a follow on for this class so that you can see the rest of the helmet come together. Because at this point, a lot of this is riveting. I think you guys got the gist of it. But what we really need to do now is talk about our cheeks. All right. So as long as you guys will stick with me, I'll keep up with this. I don't have anything to do tomorrow. And we're going to talk about doing the cheeks. Now, I've seen a lot of helmets where the cheeks go straight down, right? I mean, we've all seen that. Your hands or, away. Or they, oh, sorry. Where they go straight down or they curve under the chin. Now those are all valid methods. I don't particularly like that. I don't like anything under my chin. Um, and I usually build armor. The armor that I build, I wear. Every piece of armor I own, I've made with the exception of my gorge. My buddy, uh, Y Count Gregor Hawk up in Awartha made that for me as a bet. And I love it. You know, one of the best damn leather workers I've ever met. There you go, guys. There's the link to my, uh, to my Twitch channel. And I just started, but you get to see me build a, a solid top or a hard top that looks like that 12 gauge I showed you. Um, and it don't cost nothing, but Monday through Friday, uh, noon to four, I'm basically setting my whole shop up so people can sit here and watch me ask questions, learn. Um, also patterns will be available. Um, and I'm also trying to put together kits for this particular build for people if they're interested. If I get enough interest, it'll go, especially if it's a large group order. Um, it, we can get the cost down quite a bit. Um, if uh, you're in the neighborhood and you want to grab a sheet of metal and come on over and build a helmet, come on over. I'll we'll work with you as long as you can be here and you'll go home with a helmet. Uh, we've had a couple people do it and they all went home with some really cool helmets and uh, it was a lot of fun. And I use it as a way to get to know people. So like I said, hit that link over, hit the follow icon. There's no subscription, no cost. I do it for free. Um, and uh, then you'll be notified every time I boot up for my Twitch channel. And you can watch me do this every day, noon to four. You have helm patterns? Absolutely. How do you get them? Well, you hit me up and uh, I send them to you through the mail. I don't have any secrets. <laughs> you just got to tell me what kind of pattern. Um, you send me the size of your head and uh, I will be happy to send you a pattern to match it. Because I know you can go on Armor Archive and see a lot of awesome patterns, but they don't talk about how to put them together, how to size them, how to make them fit somebody's head who's not 29 or 21 inches. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I see. Yeah, there you go. There's a there's a link in the chat, guys. Our Gray Cat Workshop. Thank you, David. So those have those Swihammer kits. There it is right there, the Bows Grade 6. Yeah, it looks like he has all of uh, old Swihammer's patterns. Cool. 
Well, so he came up with some nice patterns for those. Talk about getting the laser cut face plate a bit. So I have them water jetted out from Castile. Um, I do customs on them. Uh, also, if you really want to know, uh, Aaron Kelly at Temple Battleworks sells them. The, my pad, the original pattern for this is his design. I've licensed from him to uh, reproduce them, um, the, at least the shape of them, the shape and the basic form. And I just put my own artwork in it and I pay him a royalty to uh, use them. Um, but Eric, do whatever artwork though. Yeah, and I could put in any, any kind of artwork. Um, and I could also refer you, but I'd like to refer you to Temple Battleworks for any kind of custom grills like that, because Aaron really put a lot of time, thought, and effort into the initial design. And uh, if he can't do it, then he'll probably send you to me if he if it's something outside his scope. Okay, so Robert asks, who is the vendor for the steaks and dishing forms? His name is Ron Halbert. You can look him up on Facebook. Halbert as in the weapon. Also, you can ask on the Armor Archives uh, in the forum board, hey, who makes ball steaks and uh, stakeholders, and they'll direct you right to him. Okay, great. So the last thing I want to talk about, because I don't think we're going to get to the slats of that or the back part of the helmet, is how to shape the cheeks. Those are kind of unique um, per, per helmet, and uh, they shape a little different. It's not just put it in the form, bang it out, and assemble it on the helmet. Because what happens is, is it tends to get up under the chin, and then you can't get your helmet on and off. So there's kind of a neat little way to do this, and I'm going to show you right now. So we're going to set this aside. So you'll notice that on my cheeks, I have a hole here and a hole here, right? These are what, these are my alignment holes. These are what I use to basically tell me where I'm going so I don't have to spend a lot of time figuring out where I want to, uh, this part, right? Because if this is slightly off, the helmet looks funky. So what we do if we take our, our piece, let me clear this for a moment. Actually, let me show you the before and after, how, how it all works out. Now, you could do it straight up and down, but I would highly recommend against it because it just doesn't have that right look, right? So what's going to happen is we're going to go ahead and put this one piece on real quick, one of the cheeks. And you'll notice... you notice it needs to have some kind of shape to match the helmet curvature of the helmet. Oh, here we go. It's right there. All right? Now, how we get that without distorting this piece enough to where it ends up like this is we take our shallower dish. Let me get my uh, PPE on here real quick. So I use a lot of left-handed gloves because that's the piece that actually touches the metal. So we're going to do is we're going to take our two pieces, right? And we need to shape them so that we're here. So what I do, lay them out on your table like so, so you always know you need to strike from the part. Now, there's two thoughts. If you want to do hinges or something, you can just completely dish this piece into this form and call it good. What I like to do, though, is I like to take my Sharpie, and I'll take my finger and I'll put it right here. Remember how we said you always want to make sure your metal's cleaned up so you don't cut yourself, right? And I'll just make it here and I'll just run my finger just approximately so I'm at the center of that hole. So I'm approximately at the center of that hole right there, okay? Now what we're going to strike is we're going to do two fingers in and we're going to draw another line just across like that. So this gives us area to dish and shape this particular part to make this round part match the curvature of the helm. All right, so we're gonna do that real quick. So, huh? Uh, not yet. So how we're gonna do this, and this is kind of a, you gotta learn how to feel this. This is gonna be the same for everyone. Uh, we use this helmet. So I'll use this hammer just to make it short. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to line 
that up this hole and I'm gonna take this flat and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to walk this curve along this line. All right, mute, we're gonna You can see I'm starting to get a curve in here, but I'm not distorting this piece, this part of it. All right, back to mute. All right, so it gives us this effect. All right. Now we can take this. Line it up onto the helmet as a test. So we can see how we did. All right. And that's not done. Now you could shape dish it more or less. It's up to you. But what I'm trying to do right now is I'm just trying to match. Oh, still needs more. Oh, because it needs more, we're going to go to a slightly deeper dish which is right here. All right, so that I could get that to match this curve. PPE on, go ahead and mute. All A little more. Now that I have this in approximate shape, depending on how wide or narrow your head is, will depend on what we want to do with this portion. I particularly like to do this. I like to take it once I get my shape and I'll just lay it on here and I'll just give it a little bit of a love tap right here. That does is that gives that a little bit of depth through here. Now you can make that as drastic or as little as you like, but it's I'm basically going for it, give it just enough to where I get a little bit of a shape. This doesn't need to be huge shape. You've got a lot of uh, or a huge a lot of curve, but that all depends on you and your preference. We're gonna go ahead and give it a little bit more. So you notice we got that nice little curve right here and we've maintained this position here. So let's go ahead and put this piece on the helmet real quick and we'll see how we do. As usual, my whole area is evolving into a giant cluster. So that gives us that kind of a shape. Clamp it. That will really tell us. There you go. See how we got a little bit of a shape, but we're not so narrow that we can't work with that. No, it does stick out a little far. But a lot of this can also be done. Let's adjust. Let's rotate it back on me here a little bit. There we go. That looks better. There you go. 
All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this next one real quick so we can get this on there and then I'll show you how to fix the rest of the, the pieces and we'll at least get to shaping the uh, flaps today. All right, go ahead and mute. Are you good? All right. Did my wife just pop out here? Yeah. I wonder what, hope everything's okay. She's checking because it's 75. That's all right. Oh. Now it's the playing game, right? Because you know your holes are in the same. So this is the part where you can just adjust these back, forth, front, back, till they line up exactly how you want. Or you can sit on it and attach your slats and wait for your safety braces. See, I generally attach my slats and wait for my safety braces because I have these two holes right here in the back. And that generally pulls everything right back into shape. But I want you guys to really see kind of how It's all supposed to work. Ah, that was slipped for. That's why everything's off. Okay. There we go. You can kind of see how those are look like they're off, but really they're not that far off. They're not as far off as they appear. There we go. So once we put all our pieces on, it'll come out about like that right there. How's that look, Sean? Does that look pretty even? Or am I off a little bit? That looks pretty even. All right, yeah. you guys all see that? I think I have a, this piece here just needs to. In my haste, I'm gonna over dish this side right here. So that's all right, we can fix that. But yeah, so that's kind of the idea. 
Now the slats for this particular helmet are really easy. I pre-do all my holes on the slats and they're really easy. They're actually just like one or two, two whacks with a hammer and that's about it. All right. I generally take them, right? So I appreciate, I cut them out, put all my holes in. You wanna pick that helmet up for me, bud? All right, and then I just give it up. And that's it. That's how you shape the slats. You wanna go ahead and hand me the helmet now? I'll take you this one. Sorry, I know we're getting close to running out of time here, but I wanna make sure you guys at least get a good idea of each piece and component. And those, because we already did our holes, just simply we go into position, all right? And I think this one needs to be a little bit further out. So we're gonna do it in the deeper dish. This one take a second. Do you flute the slat? I can, I have. It all depends on, uh, for this particular example, this is a helmet that you could build at home <laughs> and you could do whatever the hell you want with it. Now, I do flute um, depending on what I'm building and what the price point is. Because a lot of times people ask me to make them um, thousand dollar helmets and want to pay me 500 bucks so it's really it all depends on the customer and what the customer wants uh i could be i could do a fluting class at some point for everyone if you guys want fluting's not hard however i'm going to warn you now i cheat i have a machine that i built that uh actually i got from ron not built but i got from ron halbert this or mel told um for uh, fluting, so I don't have to. <laughs> to be, to be, because I hate. I really am not the biggest fan of hand fluting. So it's not that bad. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's not that bad. It's just time consuming. There we go. All right, let's go. Just about done with all these pieces. All right. With a thousand pound table with me, right? And the last one. It's the, oh, it's the clamp. Everything's falling down. No. All right. Okay, let's see, let me show all that. And that, everybody, is the slats. Now, I generally put safety bars between each one of these, and I tackled the safety bars because they just give it that extra rigidity. You can show them on the helmet that's already got all that stuff. Yeah. So, but essentially, that's the helmet. That's about... There's probably about another hour or two left of work in this with the bar building the bar grill. Um, or we could take, or you could take one of the pre crap uh, ones that I make, flap that bad boy on there, and you've got a helmet. Any questions at this point? I'll pull up one of the ones that I've already got complete or almost complete here. This is a stainless with those nightmare stainless rivets I told you about. When it's all said and done, 
That's the helmet. This is what we just built, guys and gals, lords and ladies, gentles and genteels. With one of the prefab bar grills, I'll show you. That. And you can also do other cool stuff. Um, here, let's clear, let me clear some space here. Put a nasal on it. You could put chain mail on it, change out the, the slats and the cheeks for chain mail. Um, you can change the cheeks out so they're nice and big, or you can make them nice and small. Uh, you could do a Winchellis nasal. Drop chainmail right up to the eye slot. Um, you, like you saw earlier example, you can make a Varingian. You can pretty much turn this into anything you want. Yeah, you, changing the cheeks can also change the sort of nationality of the helmet. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah, you change the undercarriage, you change the nationality of the helmet, as John just said. If you want to reach me on Facebook, I'm Kenneth Edmonds on Facebook. You guys are more than welcome to reach out and ask. And I'll do my best to get you whatever patterns or anything that you might need. Uh, you can also reach me through uh, their excellencies at Terra Premier. I'm down in Glen Dufin, which is the Medford area. Um, and I would like to do a part two to this class at some point where we can uh, fashion the bar grills. Uh, if you're interested in a D, uh, DYI thing to follow along um, in this, uh, get with me offline and we'll see about getting you paper patterns or pre-cut uh, pre and drilled uh, patterns out to you so that you can do it. Again, if you have a large class or a large group of new fighters that all need help or just people that want to, you know, get out there and mix it up and uh, want new equipment, let me know. and Maybe we can make arrangements for me to come out your way and teach a class, especially if you're on the West Coast. I can drive up and I'm right off the I-5 corridor, so I can pretty much go anywhere, uh, including Canada. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and conclude there because I'm getting hungry and it's getting about dinner time. All right. All right. Words, Your Excellency. Thank you for doing the class. And Absolutely. Uh, we can arrange a follow-up class. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. And... Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts, uh, Your Excellency? Thank you! <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, guys, shout out to my squire here, John, for doing all the camera work and setting up Thank the computer. You, John. Sure get this. Sorry yeah. it wasn't better, but... That's all right. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> when I have the when I get everything set up out here for the actual Twitch stream, we could just convert that right over to Zoom and have three different angles. Hopefully, it's I'll, I'll send you a good dry pod for Christmas or something. Yeah, <laughs> right. So he's going to be helping me do that. He's kind of my tech guy. He's also my pattern guy. So yep. whenever we get somebody saying, hey, I'd kind of like this on this, he draws it up for me. And then I take it down to uh, Sam. Sam water jets it out for me. You know, cool stuff like this. It's great having a, a neighbor like that. <laughs> so that's a different kind of grill I do. So um, as far as, like I said, anybody who's interested, look up Temple Battle Works on uh, Facebook for uh, grills. Aaron Kelly has a whole bunch of stock designs that he sells. Um, if you want something a little bit more custom, touch base with him. Uh, like I said, I licensed the, the shape of the grill from him because he invented it. Uh, and I want to make sure that he gets all credit for that. Um, just, I, I just have him add in more artwork. Uh, my spanging pattern is my own. Uh, me and the, I sat down, came up with it, and then I went and saw Sam over at Castile, and we made it mathematically freaking perfect. So, 
If anybody's interested and wants a copy of the pattern, I'm happy to share. I just ask that I don't end up two years down the road competing with you in the armor business using my pattern. Um, <laughs> if you change it up enough, cool. But uh, but if you just want to build armor for you and your community, sell a piece here and there, get some more tools to do it. I honestly, I don't really have a problem with that. Okay, if anybody else has anything or uh, has any questions, get with their excellencies to get my contact information, or you can reach out directly to me on Facebook. Um, and your excellency, thank you for allowing me to teach in your uh, barony and your sergeantry class. I appreciate it much. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. All right. You.